Hey, it's great to see you this morning. What a sweet time of worship. And we're going to close our time with, with one more song, just a proclamation together. Isn't it, be, isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord? See the kiddos singing. It's so awesome. So uh, do you ever feel like in your life you have more questions than answers? Anybody? Um, I was in Washington, D.C. this week. We got a lot of questions uh, that are happening in our in our nation, but it was a crazy time to be there. I was with a group of pastors. We actually ended up at the Bible Museum. I'm going to take a, a group there in, in the coming year. We're going to take a couple groups as part of the year of the Bible. It's an incredible deal. You need to join me there. Um, we're going to have a great time. But uh, I was able to go and to actually go to a Bible study. You don't know this. There's one on Wednesday night that happens just below the House of Congress. And we ended up in the Statuary Hall there. If you've ever been in the center of, of the Capitol building, where, um, you know, Billy Graham, John McCain, Lion State, that, that spot right there, we were there and we worshiped in that room. We took communion in that room. We prayed for our nation in that room. I mean, pastors across, you know, political lines and such, all centered on Christ and a revival in our nation. But if you've got more questions than answers, welcome to the club, right? It's a part of life. And we're going to talk about questions today. God's not afraid of our questions, as Jay has noted, um, because it's true. Think about all that you could know and don't know. Uh, you have a lot more questions in life than you do answers. If you don't learn how to live with the questions, then you're going to have trouble in life. So the first part of Job, you can turn there. In fact, we'll look at Job chapter 1, and we're going to land in chapter 3. So grab your Bible if you have it there. Chapter 1, we've, we've noted, it sets up the whole book. Uh, Job is presented on one side. He's in the land of us. We see the light up here on stage over here. And then over here, we got God and Satan in a conversation, which is wild, looking into the spiritual that Job does not see. And this whole story is set up this way. Job is over here and he's presented as the greatest man in all the earth. He has uh, more than anybody else. All these animals, you can see that in the first part of chapter one, he has, uh, which are just signs of wealth, incredible wealth. And not only that, he has this great family. He has seven sons and three daughters. Perfect family. Ten, even. I mean, these are perfect numbers. Now, some of y'all say, per ten, not an idyllic family. Okay, ten kids. <laughs> Probably not. But in, back in the day, it was. I mean, he was blessed. Not only that, but they loved him, and he worshiped God. So he's over here in, in the land of us. And then over here, on the spiritual side of things, we see a conversation between God and Satan. And of all the different questions that are asked, God is the initiator. He's the one who asked Joe, uh, Satan a question. And look at what it says. You can see it there. It's Job chapter 1, verse 8. And the Lord said to Satan, Have I, no, no, have you considered my servant Job? That there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man. See, even God proclaims him so who fears God and turns away from evil. Notice that God speaks and he points out Job to Satan. Now watch this. We know something Job doesn't know. We know God is up to something. God is going to play Job for his purposes. And watch this. Don't miss this. He's playing Satan for his purposes. This should bring great encouragement in your life. Satan does nothing in your life apart from God giving him the permission to do so. It's why the, the great reformer Martin Luther called him God's Satan. God's play, he's so sovereign, so powerful. He's playing Satan for his purposes. And so watch what happens. See, see, here's the key question we've noted in the entire book. If you're a guest or you hadn't been here, watch this. This question opens up the entire book. Chapter 1, verse 9. Satan answers the Lord with a question. See how many questions there are. Question answered with a question. Does Job fear God for no reason? Satan's question has a twofold implication. First, that Job is worshiping God because he's been doling out gifts to him. Secondly, so, so he's, and, and watch this, Job becomes every person. Job becomes you. This is where this, is where this goes. Does anyone worship God because he's God? And not because of how he's just blessing us, what he gives us. See, he's implying that worship, here's the heart of the book, is simply the law of reciprocity. 
God, you bless me, I'll worship you. When I go through troubling times, I don't know if I can trust you. If I go through real suffering and really hard, difficult times in life, I will withhold my worship. See, popular in our day, God is attacking throughout this entire book the prosperity gospel. I went to a conference some years ago. Stacy and I were at this pastor's conference. In the parking lot, I'm walking in, and there's this red Mercedes. If you have a red Mercedes, no worries. But this will, re- but this will reveal if this is your... Oh, the, the license plate said, blessed. With Z's, blessed. I'm blessed. I got a Mercedes, I'm blessed. Until you're not, Right? Until it's gone. And and, and so there's this idea that I'm going to worship God because of what he's given me. But the second implication here is that God is not worthy of worship. This is what Satan is saying. If you're not doling out gifts, nobody is going to worship you. Watch this. Evidently, God wants the whole wide world to see if anyone will worship him. Simply because he's God Almighty. That's what this book's all about. And that, my friends, listen, is at the heart of your life as well. I mean, so much so, I'm I'm about to think, why suffering? Why do we even go through suffering in this life? Could it be so that we could bring glory to God? even through the struggles of life. Because the why question is the big question of life, right? It's the one at the center of it all. If you can't answer the why question, then you're in trouble across all of life. Why? But what's at stake here? Think about this. What is at stake with this question? Well, whether Job will worship him or not. No, 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 no. That's part of it. Whether you will worship him or not. Or watch this. You know what's really at stake? The glory of God. The glory of God is at stake. Not that we're going to bring bring more greatness to him because because we're, we're going to worship him. But when we worship him with our lives, and not just simply corporately, but when we worship him through all of life, we bring glory to him and we proclaim that he is worthy of worship regardless of what's going on in my life. You see how big this is? I mean, this is the hinge point. Of, of all of our lives right here, why gets to the heart of the motive. It gets to uh, the reason. It gets to purpose. You see why? Why is the ch- most challenging question of all? Why is the greatest question? Why Job worships God is the essence of the question. And it is the question in your life as well. I can say it this way. Job goes to church every week. Why? Oh, Job, he even, you know, watch this. He even gives. Why? He gets a tax break. No, 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 no. He gives because he loves God. Or does he? You see how this plays out? In your life. Job Job reads the Bible every day. I don't know if you do or not. Job reads the Bible every day. Why? Job actually serves other people. Why? Why? You see what's in the balance? Because many of us, unknowingly, we worship God in the same way. How do you know? How would you know if you worship God because all things are going great for you? Or you worship Him simply because He's God? There's only one way. You walk through suffering. You walk through challenging times. You see how this plays out? I mean, this book is, again, blowing my mind. And before we're out of chapter 1, It looks like the grand experiment is over. Job loses everything. You know this, right? And then in verse 21, you see it, chapter 21, uh, verse 121, he says, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And you're like, game over. But it's not over. And we're grateful that it's not over. You know why? If it's over there, here's the story. Job suffers. Job trusts. Be like Job. Good luck with that. Right? Right? Praise God it's not over. Because what we'll learn over these next few weeks and throughout the book, we're going to learn what it is to really worship God in the midst of questions. So you know what happens next. Then he loses his health. Chapter 2, Satan comes at him. 
And then his friends come along. We're going to talk a lot about his friends in the days to come. He has three friends to sit with him. They're good and loving friends, by the way. I mean, we diss on them often. But look at what they do first. At the end of chapter uh, 2. They sit with him seven days and seven nights. Silently. They don't know what to say. They're undone by his suffering. You ever been there? I've been there. I mean, sitting with, with families, I'm just going, I don't even know. I got nothing. It's that ministry of presence. They're brilliant in their silence. They start speaking, not so much. But before they speak, Job speaks. Look at chapter 3. I want us to focus there, and then we're going to apply this text to our lives. What can we learn from Job's questions? We'll look at what he says. Job 3, after this, what after this? After they sit with him, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. First thing out of his mouth, Job said, let the day perish on which I was born and the night that said, a man is conceived. Okay, look, watch this. 2,000, some think as far as 4,000 years before Christ ever comes on the scene, okay? 6,000 years, perhaps, ago. He's talking about conception. I don't want to get us too uncomfortable here, but he's talking about the night, okay? This went down, he's saying, the night that I was right, conceived in my mother's womb, may that day be blotted out altogether. May there not be any cry of joy. Look at verse, uh, verse 4. Let that day be darkest. May God above not seek it, nor light shine upon it. Let gloom and deep darkness claim it. Let clouds dwell upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. What is he saying? I wish I'd never been born. That night, like like. Let, let thick darkness seize it. Let it not rejoice among the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of the months. He's saying, take it off the calendar. I wish it had never happened. And he goes on to say, okay, if I must be born, look at verse uh, 11. Why did I not die at birth? Can you imagine? Why did I come from the womb and exp- why did I come out and just expire? Why did the knees receive me? Or why the breast that I should nurse? He's saying, why did my mom even keep me alive? Why was I conceived? And when I was born, I wished that y'all had not taken care of me and given me life. And then he goes on. How sad is this? Verse 16. I wish I was just a stillborn child. I mean, this is, this is deep, dark despair. He's saying, I wish I'd never been born. And look at this, six times he asked the question, why? And then in verse 20, he asked it again. Why is light given to him who is in misery? He's saying, why do I even see this? Why am I alive to experience this? I wish I was dead. Verse 23, why is light given to a man? Only to see this. Look at verse 26. I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest. But trouble comes. He's saying, I'm anxious. I'm restless. I can't sleep. Always worrying. There's so much on my mind. I can hardly stand it. But he is in greater despair. He's saying, I wish I had never been born. I wish I wasn't alive. You know why this is in the Bible? Well, clearly, it happened. Secondly, I think at some point in life, Perhaps every one of us get to this point. Maybe you've been recently. And with all the talk of of mental health and and suicide prevention and challenges of depression in our day, I think all of us at some point get to a place where we go, "I I wish I wasn't even alive. If this is the grief, if this is life, I'm so un, uh, uh, not, not at ease, I, I, I'm, I'm unsettled, I, I'm so anxious, my life is, is closing in on me, I wish I were not even alive. Some of us in this room have been there. That's why it's here. So what do we do? What do we do when life seems to force us to ask the why question? And no answers come. Well, look at what we can learn from Job. First, Job's questions point him to God. Now you're saying, I I don't see that. Look at this. He curses the day that he was created, but created he was. There is a creator. He curses the fact that he's still alive, but he is alive. 
See, even in his darkness, Job can't avoid God, nor can you. There's a sense that he exists, and you know it. He is there for you, and you know it, and he's big enough for you to scream and to cry out to him. Sometimes we just want to crawl up in God's lap and just be loved by him. Other times we want to beat his chest and cry out to him. He's big enough for that, my friends. Keep crying out to him. Secondly, Job's questions reveal hope. Listen, our restlessness betrays us too. It's like the atheist I was talking to who was angry about the God that he does not believe in. He's crying out to God. You see, even in his struggle, he's crying out. Listen, a restless man is not a hopeless man. A troubled woman is not a hopeless woman. If there's no hope, you don't need to ask why. I mean, that's where the atheist goes, right? What's the purpose of pain and suffering? There's no purpose. There's no purpose of life. To life, there's no purpose. There's no God. Even his crying out, he believes. He wants to die, but his restless words betray him and point to life and resurrection. Watch this. Thirdly, Job's questions anticipate a deeper darkness. His questions foreshadow other questions to come. His loneliness foreshadows greater loneliness. His, his, his trouble foresees a greater trouble. Friends, listen, his darkness forecasts a greater darkness. His suffering forecasts a greater suffering, anticipates a greater suffering thousands of years before the blameless one would suffer when he would take on the wrath of God and cry out to God his own why. You see it there. Why? He's on the cross. Why have you forsaken me? God forsaken Job points us to the God forsaken Savior who would come and take on our sin and suffer more than any of us could ever imagine. But look at what Job knows. This is amazing. Revealed only by the Spirit of God. Again, Thousands of years before Christ shows up on the scene. Job knows something, and it's something big. Job chapter 19, I'm catapulting us there. We'll, 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 we'll see a lot before we get there. But look at what he says. For I know that my Redeemer lives. What? And at last he will stand upon the earth, and after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God, whom I shall see for myself. My eyes will behold him and not another. He's saying, I will see him with my own eyes. My heart faints within me. He's saying, I can't wait for the day. How does he know this? Only by the power of the spirit of God, he sees this resurrection theology before it's ever realized. And his theology is dead on. Look at what he does know. He doesn't know why, but look at what he knows. He knows by faith that his Redeemer is alive. Do you? Do you know? He knows by faith his Redeemer will stand upon the earth. Now, this is amazing. He foresees the incarnation that Christ will stand upon the earth, but it's greater still. This word stand is the word that's used when one stands in the court of law and brings testimony. This is what he's getting to. Throughout the book, Job wants to, he needs a mediator. He needs someone to adjudicate his claims. He needs someone to mediate between him and a holy God. Christ comes. He stands on the earth in the flesh. God Almighty, the great judge, becomes the redeemer. And he stands on that last day, friends. He will stand and he mediates before a holy God on your behalf and mine. He vindicates us, not because of our righteousness, but because of his. You see, he knows by faith he will see his Redeemer with his own eyes. This is amazing. God will come in the flesh and he'll stand upon the grave of every man, every woman, and your grave. And he will stand before the holy God on your behalf before the Father. Say, he, she is justified, not by their good works, by my righteousness. They've received my grace. So look at this. What do we know? 
We see what Job knows, but watch this. What do we know? Well, we know that God was at work in Job's suffering. We know about chapter one. We know something's up. Do you believe today that God is at work in your suffering? Or do you think he's out of control? He's not all powerful. He's not all sovereign. He's at work, friends. Jeff, you don't understand. My, my situation is very unique. God is at work in whatever you're going through. We know that God was at work in Job's suffering. And I want you to see this. It must be very important to God for everyone, the whole wide world, to see Job worship God through his suffering. Because watch this. We know something else. We know that God was at work in Christ's suffering. The whole world watches Christ on the cross. If worship is reduced to the law of reciprocity, religion, then we miss out on the greatest news known to man. God's unconditional grace offered to undeserving sinners like us. Worship is worship because God is worthy of our worship always, not because of what we're going through or not going through. And then finally, we know that God is at work in our suffering. Friends, you see this? This is why the book's given to us. This is why you're here today. We know that God is at work in Job's suffering. We see it. We know in the same way that God was at work in Christ's suffering. Friday was the worst day that could possibly be. Sunday was the greatest day in history. God is at work in your life. This is what we know today. He's at work in your suffering. Look at this. Every believer will go through undeserved and redemptive suffering. Undeserved, but watch this, always redemptive. And he's at work in your life. This is what the Bible teaches us in, in Romans 5. Not only that, what is that? Not only are we saved by grace, but we know we can rejoice in our sufferings. Knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character, character, hope and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is here to testify for us, to give us strength as we walk through suffering and to worship God through whatever comes our way. It's why Paul would say in Romans eight, for I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory of that is to be revealed to us. As the band comes up, we're going to sing a song together. One last song. And listen, I don't want anybody to move. You know, so Jeff, I got to go get my child. They'll be fine. Now I got to beat, beat the Methodist to the restaurant. No, no, no. Well, you can get there. Here's what I'm saying. There's a moment when you just need to proclaim that I will worship God regardless of what comes my way. And you have an opportunity to stand. I will. My Redeemer lives. And He stands upon the earth. And he's adjudicating my claims before God. And I, I don't have a leg to stand on, but he is my mediator. He's the one who's made me holy before God. Friends, listen. This week, this is why I want us to proclaim this song and have it in our heads and leave. This week, a watching world is going to see if you worship God because he's God and he's worthy or you worship him if he blesses you. If you're blessed, do you worship him truly? Or is your worship the law of reciprocity? You've got a chance to prove it this week. Watch, if you're married, you've got a spouse that's going to watch. I'm convicted by this. I want Stacy to see me worship God, regardless of what comes my way. Will you worship him when you're not the center of the universe? When things don't go your way? And watch this. If you have kids, they get a front row seat to see if mom and dad, if anyone will worship God because he's God. Not because, well, he's blessing us today. Teaching your kids that life goes something like this. And you can't trust God through it all. You have the opportunity this week to say, I'm going to build my life upon Christ and Christ alone. I will not be shaken because my Redeemer lives. God, we worship you with our lives. We give you all that we are because you're worthy of our worship. 
And even now we proclaim together how good it is to proclaim together what we know is true. You are Lord and we worship you. It's in your name that we pray. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.